pleasure and honor to address this sixth session of the African Regional Forum for Sustainable Development. I would like to thank the government and the people of Zimbabwe for hosting this forum in this amazing, amazing setting. God's worth, God's work on earth. This annual meeting comes at a decisive moment for delivering the goals to our mutually reinforcing agendas, Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063. Over the course of 2019, major scientific and analytical reviews have made it clear to us in the world that we are not on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And just a few weeks ago, the African Union's first report on the implementation of Agenda 2063 demonstrated that despite early progress, there is still an urgent need for enhanced action. 2020 is an opportunity for all of us to chart a different course and to kickstart a decade of action to deliver the SDGs as called for by the Secretary General at last September's summit. It is why all regional fora for the SDGs take an added sense of urgency this year, starting in Africa today. Region by region, we will build momentum as the world enters the decade of action. I'm convinced that with the leadership by African governments and strong support from their partners and young people, the decade of action can deliver major improvements in peace and prosperity across the continent. While the high-level political forum will continue to provide the main platform for global engagement and sharing of experiences on the SDGs, the decade will also allow for an annual stock-taking of our collective journey towards 2030. And I can assure you that the Secretary General and the United Nations Development System will be with you every step of the way. Excellencies and friends, as we begin this exciting decade, it is vital that we recognize the progress that is being made in Africa on multiple fronts. Africa continues to have some of the world's fastest growing economies, and growth is projected to remain stable in 2020. The proportion of people living in poverty is declining, from 34.5% in 2015 to 32.5% in 2019. In 10 countries, poverty rates are below 10%. Africa has made progress in the quest for peace and security, mostly by strengthening continental response frameworks and institutions, as well as by working with the United Nations and other organizations on the ground to secure inclusive transitions. There have been considerable gains in health outcomes, with less women and children dying in childbirth or because of diseases, improvements in access to education and electricity, and a dramatic rise in internet connectivity. Commitments on climate action are also encouraging, with all African countries having signed the Paris Agreement and 48 having ratified. Significant momentum is building through initiatives like the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Over the past five years, many governments have aligned their national plans and strategies with the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063. And by the end of a high-level political forum this year, 45 African countries will have completed voluntary national reviews. This wide-ranging progress has been achieved because of African leadership. The engagement of Africans' young people, sound policies, and effective international cooperation. But as, let, let us make no mistake, in Africa as elsewhere, we need to accelerate the pace and the scale of our collective action. The absolute number of people living in poverty on the continent has been increasing since 2013, owing in part to high population growth rates. That number has now reached 428 million people. Africa also has the highest prevalence of hunger, with 22.8 million people severely food insecure, many of whom have to go to bed hungry. Income inequality is also high, and in most African countries, the rate of youth unemployment is more than twice that of its adults. Gender equality is costing Sub-Saharan Africa $95 billion every year in lost opportunities. Africa's natural environment is also suffering. Forest cover is disappearing by half a percent annually. Africa is expected to lose 50% of its birds and its mammals by 2050. And the impacts of climate change are already being felt with the destruction of cyclones Idai and Kenneth, the ongoing locust infestation across vast swaths of East Africa, 
and numerous underreported climate-linked crises from the Sahel through Zamb Zambia to Kenya and Madagascar. The nexus between climate change, hunger, terrorism, conflict, and displacement is causing havoc and human suffering in many countries, and not least in the Sahel and the Horn. It represents a tremendous challenge to our continent. Excellencies, the scale of the task before us is immense, but the success of the SDGs depends on the success of Africa 2063. Just as China's remarkable achievements in lifting its people out of poverty contributed to major advances under the Millennium Development Goals, so can Agenda 2063 have similar impact on our SDGs. Action in just 14 African countries that have both populations of more than 10 million and more than 7 million people living in extreme poverty could reduce poverty by almost 80%. So it can be done. Success is possible. But only if we generate more ambition, more mobilization, and more solutions. Allow me to touch briefly on each of these imperatives. First, ambition. Since no country is on track to deliver by 2030, every country has to increase their ambition. That starts with national plans, with policies, budgets, and institutions that are commensurate with what it will take to deliver universal access to quality social services and an economy that provides decent jobs for everyone. It also requires national financing frameworks that support governments in mobilizing and aligning financing from all sources, urgently and at scale. As a continent, with the lowest ratios of tax to gross domestic product, the potential to mobilize more domestic resources does exist through tax and fiscal policy reforms, better tax revenue management exists. Ambition also demands a full embrace of the SDGs by our partners in business, technology, science, and in academia. And it requires the delivery of strong commitments at this year's major global meetings on climate change, biodiversity, sustainable transport and oceans, all of which are critical for Africa's future. The second imperative, mobilization. We need to see a stronger involvement of the general public for sustainable development. We need to do more to ensure that all Africans see their futures in the SDGs and the goals of Agenda 2063. With a staggering three quarters of Africa's population under the age of 35, young people must be a central focus, and not just in terms of economic inclusion, but as drivers of those changes that these agenda agendas demand. We've seen many examples of positive engagement of young people across the continent in recent years, whether relating to corruption, violence against women, or the incredible voice of our young person from Zimbabwe at COP25. We've seen that we need to do more to encourage and expand and harness such efforts. That includes creating space in policymaking and providing an enabling environment that allows their free expression and embraces their energy, ideas, and innovation. And I can tell you, I heard that from Zimbabweans and other children of East Africa, youth of East Africa, who spoke to us yesterday on technology, on science, on inclusion, on leadership. In other words, they said they were ready, we just needed to move over so that they had a chance to lead. The third imperative is solutions. To deliver change at the scale that our agendas demand, major increase in international investment and support for African solutions are needed urgently. Silencing the guns is one such effort that demands support. Building climate smart Africa infrastructure, expanding access to clean and renewable energy, ensuring that every young person has a quality education and the skills and training for a job that will make a difference and help them real, realize their aspirations. These are among the challenges that demand a surge in investment in capacity, technology, and know-how, that demand much stronger and more effective partnerships and cooperation that we have seen since 2015. Excellencies and friends, in all of this, you can continue to count on the support of the United Nations family. At the national level, the reforms of the UN resident coordinator system and a new generation of UN country teams now offer a much stronger, more cohesive platform to provide governments with integrated policy and programmatic support. 
we are also concluding an ambitious process to reposition the UN development system at the regional level. The Secretary General will be providing his final recommendations in this regard to our UN Economic and Social Council this year. I'm confident that you will see a step change, both in the depth and the impact of our operational and other interventions, working hand in hand with the African Union. The regional reform will help us to strengthen coordination and mobilize the necessary resources and give us much more robust knowledge, management hubs that we can share. It will lead to greater transparency and results-based management. Data will improve. Transboundary efforts will grow more sophisticated. We will be able to better advocate regional positions and issues at global level, including the repatriation of billions of dollars lost in illicit financial flows. The African continental free trade area is yet another platform to generate the gains we seek. Excellencies, there's no denying that we have a mountain to climb over the coming decade. But as Nelson Mandela and Madiba has taught us, it always seems impossible until it is done. It will take all of us, our leaders, the governments of Africa, the African Union Commission, young people, women, development partners, the UN development system, and so many more to leverage the decade of action to deliver the SDGs and our common vision for a more peaceful and prosperous Africa. The African Regional Sustainable Development Forum has a key role to play, and we saw the beginnings of that in Morocco last year, checking the pulse of progress each year and identifying ways in which we can scale and go faster. I can see just by looking at this room that Africa has both the energy, the leadership, and the determination to make that happen. And my engagement with the African youth, again yesterday, left me with a great sense of hope. This is a generation that has the optimism, the resolve, the truth, the creativity to realize Africa's full potential. Their future, our future, is absolutely now. So I look forward to hearing from all of you over the course of the next two days on how we can together raise ambition, accelerate action to ensure that there is a future of dignity, of peace, and of prosperity for all. I thank you.